and by the um, Humboldt County Library. Now we both we have the same first name, but the, the historical society is a um, private nonprofit, whereas the Humboldt County Library is a tax supported entity. So we encourage membership. Uh, that's how we support most of our work, which is collecting Humboldt history. Um, and we provide some things like this for free because we have the use of the library. If you're not a member of the society, please become one. If you don't have a library card, that's how they make their count and get their tax dollars, get one. <laughs> um, the, uh, the Saturday lecture next month, the first Saturday in November, will not be at the library because they are closed for some reason. And we will be at the Board of Education Conference Center. It's a new big conference center with stuff. You go in off of Myrtle or off of West. I think you can still get off of West um, to get into that parking lot. It has been added to the, the complex of Board of Education buildings that were there previously. The old Franklin School, for those of you who don't know about Board of Education. Um, <laughs> at any rate, we will be there. Watch the paper for the announcement of who the speaker will be. And, and I think the time will be the same, but I don't guarantee it. Um, at any rate, watch that. Uh, because this is a talk about the Milwaukee, we have somebody donated um, some plaques that they made up with a piece of the decking of the Milwaukee that was salvaged at the time and then kept for a very long time um, by uh, one family and then donated to have somebody do something with it. So they were originally one price, now they're um, much reduced. We cannot actually sell them here, so if you would like one, um, I think that uh, <coughs> there's there's something there to fill out. Yes? No? What's that piece of The easiest is just to go straight to the historical okay. society. Just go straight to the historical society when they're open, which is not today, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they are open Wednesday through Friday um, from... Uh, 12.30 to 6.30. Change their hours on me. <laughs> so 12.30 to 6.30, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Um, if you would like one of those Milwaukee um, plaques with a piece of the Milwaukee deck in it. Um, and I will now turn this over to Tom Mays, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm Tom Mays. I'm a professor of history at Humboldt State. Uh, Savannah Smith here is one of my recent graduates, our recent graduates from the school that we're quite happy with. Uh, she is an incredible, uh, she was an incredible student, and now she's working at Hanson Insurance in town, but uh, um, uh, let me tell you about her work ethic. She approached me one day and said, are you looking for a, a teaching assistant? And for years I've never used one. I, I do my own work. Um, and, and I said, sure, I'll, I'll give you a shot at it. And I said, but you know I teach at 7.30 in the morning. That's when I teach my first freshman class, my entire military. I've been up for a couple hours. And she goes, yeah, I'll do that every morning. She's there before I am. Having a student sign in and dealing with all of them for two years. She did quite, quite a work ethic that I'm quite impressed with, uh, especially in Humboldt County. <laughs> expressed an interest for her senior thesis. We have students write a, a full article, at least 25 pages, with full footnotes and endnotes and bibliography and all this other stuff. And she, we kicked around a bunch of ideas last spring, and she brought up the Milwaukee as one of them. And I had been doing some research in the National Archives and found out that many of the original records going back through World War I have now become declassified including court-martial records. And I said, why don't you contact the National Archives and see if they have anything on the Milwaukee and what happened here off of Samoa. How many pages do we end up getting? Um, over 200. And we've got more work to do. With yeah. it. We're still mining it for more information. Hmm. So this is almost preliminary. The, the uh, story she's going to relate to us is going to be printed quite soon in the Humboldt Historian. So maybe in a couple issues. 
Yeah, probably. I think we're going to try to split it next week. So it, and it's just going to be some amazing stuff. So I'll just go ahead and give it to Savannah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everybody. Let me turn on my mic. Um, okay, can you guys hear me back there? Okay, hopefully this thing stays put. <laughs> All right, so as uh, Tom said, this is my senior research project. Um, I originally took interest in it because of the first history class I took as a history major doing uh, what we called searches and seizures in the library, where we went and picked a file out of the humble room, and I picked shipwrecks. And um, ever since 2012 when I did that, I've had an interest in this topic, so that's why I chose to do this. <clears throat> so, recently, the Department of the Navy declassified documents related to the grounding of the USS Milwaukee and the events that surrounded it. These documents provide excellent insight to the events that unfolded from December 1916 to April 1917 on Samoa Beach in Eureka. Having never been examined by a historian, they shed the story in a whole new light. Furthermore, the documents remedy some misinformation given in prior historical accounts of this event. The letters, telegrams, ship records, reports, and court transcripts collected by the National Archives, interwoven with local news articles from the Humboldt Times, elucidate a narrative that is too often mistaken. What can be deduced from the documents is this. The loss of the USS Milwaukee was a foolish sacrifice made by a stubborn, inexperienced commander. Had local advice been heeded from the landing of the H-3 submarine on Samoa Beach, the Milwaukee would not have needed to leave dry dock in San Francisco, and a very costly sea disaster would have been avoided. These wrecks, which have often been attributed to bad luck, a rough sea, or st stormy weather, were the result of the faults of man. The northern coast of California, charming from land and tumultuous from sea, is often referred to as the graveyard of the Pacific. Prior to the groundings of the H-3 submarine and the USS Milwaukee, 27 vessels ran aground in this vicinity. Such wreckage was a result of tricky currents and the fact that Humboldt Bay is more of an inlet than a true bay. The Humboldt Bar is the primary obstacle with the ability to stop ships as they come in or trap ships as they go out. Despite Humboldt Bay's reputation, it was a point of interest for the U.S. Navy, which was seeking useful ports for submarine bases. By December 1916, the United States was still uninvolved in the Great War, with President Woodrow Wilson insisting upon a policy of non-intervention. However, it is evident that the U.S. Navy was bolstering their defenses along the Pacific in preparation for war. Submarines especially were gaining in prowess, and the Navy sought to establish a coast torpedo force comprised of submarines and destroyers in the Pacific. The H-3 submarine, or the Garfish, was the third of 24 submarines to be outfitted as a part of the Coast Torpedo Fleet. The seamen assigned to the Coast Torpedo Force ships were to be trained for service on submarines and destroyers, making the living quarters on submarines unnecessary. Men would be housed aboard their tender ship. Thus, thus the submarines were built to be small and efficient. To augment their efforts with the Coast Torpedo Fleet, the Navy sent the Cheyenne and its three submarines to call at ports along the Pacific coast, which you can see there in the picture. The ports in question were Coos Bay and Humboldt Bay, both of which would be surveyed to determine the potential for serving as submarine bases. In early December 1916, the flotilla departed from Bremerton, Washington to head south. The flotilla did not reach Humboldt Bay until the morning of the 14th of December 1916, which was fraught with fog. It was this fog that misled the navigator of the H-3 submarine as it felt its way towards the bay's entrance. Due to rough weather farther north and battery trouble upon exiting the Columbia River, the submarine had a disabled diesel and was running on only one engine. This would not suffice in Humboldt Bay. Unable to see clearly through the fog, the H-3 drifted towards the Samoa Dunes. The submarine's crew perhaps mistook the lumber company's chimney ashore as the beacon on the north jetty, or perhaps a column of smoke from the mothership, and course was mistakenly set right into the breakers. When their mistake was realized, the crew was unable to recover, recover the submarine from the breakers on only one engine. The H-3 ran aground on Samoa Beach in the heavy surf, as you can see there. The SOS from the H-3 submarine reached the Samoa Life Saving Station, and a crew was immediately sent to rescue the seamen. 
The SOS requested haste as some men were injured and suffering from leaked battery gas. When the crew reached the beach, the submarine was about 300 yards out in the surf and the waves toyed with their victim. Recognizing that the surf was too rough to launch a life-saving boat, the crew sought to rig a breeches buoy, which you can see here. What they did is they tethered one end to the shore and one end to the ship, and it was like a zip line, yeah. <laughs> but with pants. <laughs> Later hailed a hero by the Humboldt Times, local surfman Werner Swines left, leapt from a lifeboat to attach the line to the submarine. The, quote, big Norseman was successful and rescue efforts ensued. Other Coast Guard men joined Swines to assist in getting the 27 submarine men safely ashore with the breeches buoy. Though bruised and battered, all of the men and their commander, Lieutenant Harry R. Bogush, joined the many onlookers on the beach, and they were subsequently taken into local care. The next day, the Humboldt Times front page headline read, H3 wrecked, crew is saved. <coughs> the newspaper credited the heroic surfmen who were part of the local life-saving station for saving the crew. In an aside, Lieutenant Bogush of the H3 credited the courage of his men for the ability of all 27 of them to be rescued. He told the paper, were it not for the splendid courage and perfect discipline of my men, we would not all be here tonight. At all times, the men showed perfect discipline and under the most trying circumstances and in the face of danger. While Lieutenant Bogush was comfortable bragging about his men, he would not comment on the cause of the wreck, nor thank the locals for their assistance in the rescue. Furthermore, conflict between the Navy and the Coast Guard arose almost immediately. When Lieutenant William B. Howe, commander of the Cheyenne, showed indignation towards Captain Ellison of the life-saving crew. According to the Humboldt Times, Lieutenant Howe criticized Captain Ellison because he would not immediately launch a boat, despite the surf being rough. Howe called Ellison's refusal to risk a boat full of surfmen poor service. Regardless of the service Lieutenant Howe may have grown accustomed to, the local life-saving crew and local volunteers managed to save and care for the 27-man submarine crew with no loss of life for the Navy or Coast Guard. Moreover, the crewmen were taken into local homes and showed every attention. Despite being shown immense hospitality, the clash of perspectives would persist. Humboldt locals came from all over to witness the H3 submarine and help when they could. The numbers were staggering, with the Humboldt Times claiming that several thousand people from Eureka, Samoa, and surrounding points had gathered on the beach to view the wreck and be of any assistance they could. So many locals swarmed to see this peculiar sight that the ferry system from Eureka to Samoa became overwhelmed. Others chose to capitalize on the event, such as commercial fishermen who took locals to the site in their boats. Furthermore, rumors became thick as the fog. The rumors included, but were likely not limited to, that the gas on board killed everyone, or that the submarine torpedoes might launch any moment. <laughs> While neither was true, they drove quite a crowd to the beach. It was easy to capitalize on the incident, even in town. The Pastime Theater in Eureka showed a film just three weeks after the submarine's grounding called Wreck of the Submarine, which was all about the H3. The film even advertised Eureka citizens caring for rescue crew. Not only were the locals profiting from the event, they were patting themselves on the backs, and rightfully so. Local profit aside, the Navy could not profit with a submarine sitting on Samoa Beach. Despite much rolling in the surf, the H-3 submarine was not badly damaged, and plans were devised to refloat it. However, coastal winter weather would have its way. On the 18th of December, 1916, the Humboldt Times reported frog fog as the primary cause for delay on salvage efforts. The crew of the Cheyenne attempted to float lines to the submarine using buoys and a dory the day prior, but these attempts failed. The newspaper noted that local experts, who have gathered a wealth of experience from personal knowledge of wrecks occurring on the Humboldt coast during the past 20 years, seem to hold the opinion that the most feasible method of solving the H3 is transportation over land across the narrow Samoa Peninsula and relaunching inside the bay. A similar excerpt voices the same opinion. A skid road, a bull donkey, plenty of line, and lots of grease is the suggestion of local waterfront and logging men as a solution for relaunching the submarine H3. The paper also notes that this scheme was not without precedent. Indeed, a Portland house moving company had succeeded in doing the same when the Columbia Light River lightship ran aground. 
Already it seemed that locals knew that any attempts to tug the H-3 back out to sea were futile, and the submarine was moving farther inshore each day. By the 17th of December, she could already be boarded from the beach at low tide. The clock was ticking for the Navy's plan to pull the submarine out to sea. On the 18th of December, 1916, a line was successfully attached from the submarine to the Cheyenne, with credit attributed to Lieutenant Bogish and a small crew in a borrowed Coast Guard surf boat. The plan was to pull the submarine out at high water that night using the Cheyenne and a tugboat, the Arapaho. However, this attempt was unsuccessful. Not only did the submarine scarcely move, a steel eye holding the line in place broke due to heavy strain. Growing, Lieutenant Bogush, growing stubborn, insisted to the Humboldt Times that criticisms regarding the Navy's methods of salvage were unimportant because the H-3 was no ordinary vessel. He argued that the curve on the bottom of the submarine meant it could be easily pulled off the beach. Also, the submarine had incurred minimal damage. <coughs> Lieutenant Bogush asserted that the Navy would attempt to run another line the next day. This excerpt featured on the eighth page of the newspaper, unlike prior articles that were headliners. Perhaps this was a sign of the decline in local interest in the situation or the growing displeasure with Lieutenant Bogush. Instead, the paper delved into gossip regarding the rising tensions between the Navy and the Coast Guard, mm -hmm. specifically between the Cheyenne's commander, Lieutenant Howe, and Captain Ellison of the Life Saving Station. An inspection was ordered from Washington, and Captain S.B. Winram, an assistant inspector, was sent to put the conflict to rest. The article states that Howe did indeed accuse Ellison of the inability or hesitation to run a lifeboat out to the H-3 in an appropriate amount of time. Clearly, tensions were present between the Navy and the locals, despite a highly successful rescue mission, as aforementioned. For the Navy, frustration escalated with when any attempts to run a new line on December 20th were unsuccessful. By the 22nd of December, a headline in the Humboldt Times read, Salvage Work Abandoned on Submarine H-3. And it was stated that the Navy would be turning the job over to a private company due to the inefficacy of prior salvage attempts. The naval vessels that were managing salvage efforts proceeded back to Mare Island Navy Yard in San Francisco, and salvage opportunities would be left to civilians. At last, the locals had the opportunity to make a bid with their plan. In fact, it seems that a telegram from the Mercer Fraser Company of Eureka on the 21st of December may have prompted the Navy's call for bids. Their message stated, We are equipped to haul submarine H-3 over Peninsula and relaunch same in Humboldt Bay. It is our opinion, and seems to be the opinion of great many others, that this is the practical way of handling her if you fail in the procedure you are now taking. As to our ability and knowledge in handling this class of work, and if you are interested enough, we can give you good references, or you can find out more about us by getting in touch with any concern that is interested in shipping or lumber business in Humboldt Bay. The men who offered in this telegram to haul a submarine were accustomed to moving coastal redwoods many of which were wider and longer than the H-3. To them, the task was simple and practical, as evidenced by their nonchalance in the telegram. Moreover, they were eager to make an offer before the Navy even had the chance to call for bids. Locals, obviously ready to voice their opinion via newspaper and telegram, firmly knew that their method would work. After all, that method sustained their timber industry. Surely it could move a small submarine. The Humboldt Times reported optimistically, expecting the government would take their bid. The news of the bid hit the front page on the 30th of December, and the $18,000 Mercer Fraser offer was already recognized as the lowest bid given. As the lowest bid, the locals seemed to have no doubt it was the best. In contrast to the mere $18,000 offer, a large marine salvage company bid $150,000 to pull the submarine off the shore and into the water a method which the Navy had already attempted. The Navy was dissatisfied with both offers. The highest bid was too large, and it was a method they had already tried to execute themselves. The lowest bid was to considered too low to be taken seriously, and Mercer Fraser was rejected. Unconvinced a submarine might move like a log, the Navy carried on with their plans. This was in part due to the urging of Lieutenant William F. Newton, who had commanded the Arapaho during the first attempts at tugging the H-3 off the shore. In a letter to Admiral W.B. Caperton, Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Fleet, 
Lieutenant Newton voiced his firm opinion that moving the submarine over the sand should be, quote, the last resort. Lieutenant Newton had experience salvaging the same H-3 submarine when he ran it into the rocks at Point Sur in June 1915. <laughs> and he wished to use this experience as a model. However, that model was flawed. <laughs> He suggested that, in addition to the Cheyenne, they would need the large tug Iroquois and the cutter McCullough, and better yet, an armed cruiser with winches to pull the H-3 out to sea. Having pulled the submarine out to sea once before, he could, believed it could be done again. Lieutenant Newton stated that under no circumstances should the salvage of the H-3 be attempted by hauling her over the sand dunes. Lieutenant Newton was unyielding in his assertions, and his failure to be open-minded cost the Navy a ship. Receptive to Lieutenant Newton's suggestions, Admiral Caperton had the tug Iroquois ordered north to Humboldt Bay on the 30th, de 30th of December. Moreover, the Admiral advised the Mare Island Navy Yard to send the USS Milwaukee once her repairs were completed. The USS Milwaukee, a first-class cruiser built by Union Ironworks in San Francisco and commissioned in 1906, was the Coast Torpedo Force flagship and tender. At 10,000 tons, and a $7 million value, she was quite a ship. In comparison to the Cheyenne and Iroquois' combined horsepower of 3,400, 3, the SS Milwaukee had 24,000 horsepower, perhaps enough to pull the H-3 out to sea. The Milwaukee was a dry dock when the H-3 landed on Samoa Beach as she was undergoing an overhaul to fit her as a tender ship for the Coast Torpedo Force. Because she was in dry dock for an extended time, Force Commander Admiral Caperton, a man with 20 years' experience, was detached from the ship. Thus, his senior officer, Lieutenant Newton, with only 10 years of experience, mostly in submarines, became temporary commander of the Milwaukee. Lieutenant Howe of the Cheyenne and commander of the Coast Torpedo Fleet would be placed in charge of salvage operations overall, and Lieutenant Newton and Lieutenant Bogush would report to his command. On Mare Island, a salvage board was formed to devise a plan of action and aid the officers in their efforts. The salvage board consisted of four men, Naval Constructor Robert B. Hilliard, Lieutenant Milton S. Davis, Lieutenant Junior Gray, Charles N. Yates, and Ensign Harold Parmley, all of whom were ordered on the 2nd of January by Captain F. M. Bennett to go to Eureka and determine the best method of salvage. According to their report, they held an informal meeting once all parties were present on the 8th of January. <coughs> At the meeting, the officers and the salvage board determined they would attempt to pull the submarine off the shore, as they had attempted weeks before. Their optimism was perhaps fueled by the line that was successfully run from the Cheyenne to the H-3 the day prior. Anticipation stirred on the beach, and crowds gathered to a size comparable to when the submarine went ashore. The Navy men hoped for success, while the locals awaited disaster. <laughs> Regrettably, the 438-man crew that was assembled aboard the USS Milwaukee was one of machinists and storekeepers instead of skilled seamen. This is fitting for a tender ship, but not for salvage operations and deadly breakers. Having had luck with submarine salvage before, Lieutenant Newton likely did not anticipate needing skilled men. However, he was keen enough to ask Lieutenant Junior Grade Harvey Hayslip to serve as the navigating officer aboard the Milwaukee. Hayslip facilitated salvage efforts immensely. On the 10th of January, Lieutenant Newton directed Hayslip to assemble a small crew in a whaleboat to plant two buoys as close to the first line of breakers as possible. These buoys would serve as reference marks. Hayslip carried out these orders, venturing into the dangerous January waves, and he remarked that, quote, When we returned aboard, the buoys did not look as close to the first line as we knew them to be. The captain thought that we could have planted them closer. He had not yet seen those breakers as we had heard them, or felt them beneath the lifting boat. Lieutenant Newton, with his stubborn disposition, would question his men throughout the salvage efforts, despite their first-hand experiences. It was not the fault of the men that the buoys refused to enter the surf and serve as reference points. Yet, Lieutenant Newton treated it as such. He subsequently ordered Hayslip to assemble a volunteer crew to run a line from the Milwaukee to the submarine and under Hayslip's request, they borrowed a more able surf boat from the Coast Guard cutter McCullough. The local life-saving crew thought the Navy officer's plan to run a line ashore was foolish, 
and their commander made clear that it could be a suicide mission. The dangers of the surf proved true as Lieutenant Hayslip and his men were tossed about in the waves. Their surf boat capsized, leaving Hayslip unconscious, G.B. Roth with a dislocated shoulder, and worst of all, H.J. Parker dead from drowning. All of the men were battered, and yet the line was successfully run from the Milwaukee ashore to the H3. The Humboldt Times cited this as the most important step in progress. Indeed it was. By running this first line, supplementary and larger lines were attached to the Milwaukee until the lines were suited enough to pull. Though the original plan was to have the Cheyenne pull the submarine and have the Milwaukee pull on the Cheyenne, Lieutenants Howe and Newton decided the bigger ship, the Milwaukee, should be the primary towing vessel. Thus the plan looked something like this. I can explain it to you with my hands. <laughs> so the submarine's on the shore, the Milwaukee would pull on the submarine, the Cheyenne would pull on the Milwaukee, and the Iroquois would pull to the north to keep the ships from drifting south with the currents. And you can see all the ships out there in the photo. Just barely, you can see their silhouettes. The first pull was made just after the first high tide on January 11th, and only gentle strain was used. They took a second pull at high tide with moderate strain lasting for an hour and 10 minutes. The next day, they attempted another pull at the first high tide with the greatest advisable strain for two hours. When this attempt was unsuccessful, Lieutenant Howe of the Cheyenne suggested waiting for the highest monthly tide on January 20th. He ordered Lieutenant Newton to drop his anchors and cease hauling. Moreover, the line from the Cheyenne to the Milwaukee had been accidentally detached by the propellers, and the Cheyenne was forced to anchor farther out for safety. Without the Cheyenne attached, the Milwaukee would fail if she tried another pull. Despite Lieutenant Howe's orders, <coughs> Lieutenant Newton foolishly decided to try another pull on the submarine at high tide on the 13th of January in dense fog. At 2.15 a.m., Lieutenant Newton advised his men to work up to 60 turns, the highest advisable speed agreed upon, and they accomplished this by 3.23 a.m. By 3.42 a.m., Lieutenant Newton ordered the men to sh slow the ship to 30 turns. At this same time, Lieutenant Junior Grade George L. Weiler hailed Lieutenant Newton to ask if he felt the shock run through the ship. The rudder met the sand. Lieutenant Newton, acknowledging the predicament, sent orders flying. He ordered his men to drop starboard and port anchors, and he sent a message to the Iroquois to go full speed ahead. He ordered both engines on his ship to stop to slacken the tow line to the submarine so it could be slipped free. Unfortunately, even with engines stopped, the strain from the current was too great and the line could not be slipped. Thus, all hacksaws were put to work to detach the cables. Despite all of these efforts, the Milwaukee gradually drifted south until she was parallel and broached with the beach. The Iroquois pulled as best as she could, but under such strain, the tow line between the ships parted at 4.20 a.m. The Milwaukee dragged the Iroquois south with some lines still attached, but the men of the Iroquois were able to use axes to set their ship free just as they were drifting into the breakers. The Milwaukee would not have such luck. Lieutenant Newton, failing to redirect the ship northward, ordered the men to attempt backing out. They went full speed astern on the port <coughs> engine to no avail. By 5 a.m., any attempts to save the Milwaukee were abandoned. The ship met its demise. Having already printed a paper for that day, the Humboldt Times ran another to advertise the wreck. Once the fog cleared at 8.40 a.m., the disaster was revealed. Though radiograms were sent hours prior, nothing could be done to help the men on board until they could fully assess the situation. The life-saving crew rigged a breach's buoy, just as they, had, as they had done almost a month prior, and rescue efforts ensued by 2 p.m. The breach's buoy was too slow a method to save 438 men, however, and boats were sent by the Coast Guard and Navy alike to usher men ashore, as you can see there. Additionally, numerous civilians volunteered, causing the Humboldt Times to brag that, quote, the people of Eureka and vicinity showed the metal they were made of. The combined effort had all men ashore by 8.15 p.m. The crew of the Milwaukee was taken in by various local entities, including the Hammond Lumber Company and the Sequoia Yachting and Boating Club. Men also stayed at Camp H3, which had been established after the <coughs> of the submarine. 
and aboard the Cheyenne. The Humboldt Times reported that, as to the matter of feeding, well, Eureka's restaurant's keepers had a busy night. Those men, they will tell you, were hungry. <laughs> Satiated and safely ashore, the men awaited the wreck's aftermath. So here you can see um, news about the Hammond Company and the Yacht Club. I was lucky enough to find this picture yesterday about the dog that was rescued off of the ship. I was very excited. There's also a cat, but I couldn't find a picture of the cat. <laughs> As they had before, thousands of locals swarmed to the beach to the point that a wharf collapsed when the crowd became too much to handle. And a woman broke her ankle, unfortunately. Words of appreciation were expressed from the Milwaukee crew to the locals for their assistance and hospitality, a kindness that had not been afforded to them when the H3 wrecked. Also, gold and valuables were removed from the ship, and a camp was established on the beach to protect the remaining valuables on board. After hearing the news, Admiral Caberton proceeded swiftly to Eureka to inspect the damage. Even the locals surmised that the cause of the wreck, explaining that a court martial was imminent. <laughs> Admiral Caperton and fellow officers arrived January 16th and stayed at the Hotel Vance in Eureka, which became their headquarters. It was determined that there was approximately $1 million on board the ship worth salvaging including dunite shells and black powder. 200 men would remain to aid in the salvage efforts. I thought this top, the top picture up there was really cool. You can see right after the wreck, the hole was already starting to uh, tear in half. <laughs> Though Admiral Caperton and some others seriously considered attempting to save the ship as a whole, the idea was impossible to carry out. Though the newspaper entertains this idea multiple times. Thus, bids were taken for the construction of a pier to the Milwaukee to help in salvage efforts. <coughs> Mercer Fraser was the only company to bid within 10 days, and this bid was accepted. Also, Mercer Fraser's offer to move the submarine was finally accepted by the Navy. <laughs> so, I have a series of photos that I thought that show how the submarine was moved. Um, the second one, there's a little fuzzy, but you can see they um, had to dig around in the sand. Um, it was all pretty elaborate and it took them quite a bit of time to get it out of the sand. Um, and then they moved it across the spit like they would a redwood tree. <laughs> and they just rolled it on log rollers and relaunched it in the bay. Alright. And there it goes. <laughs> Right. Meanwhile, on the beach, the, uh, the pier and the railroad, railroad um, completed by Northwestern Pacific Railway Company, were successfully extended to the Milwaukee. And the man you see standing there next to the ship um, is possibly Harry Pittman um, on the back. It said Harry Pittman with a question mark. He was the man who um, got the bid to remove all of the movable goods from the Milwaukee and salvage as much as possible. He was from San Francisco. There's the railroad, moved all the way over. The plan was to um, run carts directly to the ship, load up the carts, and the railroad connected all the way down to San Francisco. It went from the beach, Hammond Lumber Company, and all the way down. <coughs> and that's an aerial view, which I can only assume was taken from the very tippy top of the mast of the Milwaukee. As you can sort of see the line there in the top. And that's um, the camp they established to house the men and some of the goods. And you can see him and Lumber Company up there. While salvage efforts were underway, the inquiries began. The Humboldt Times reported January 20th that, quote, court is ordered. And indeed, the USS Pueblo started north for the trial. Also, the investigation of Captain Ellison of the life saving crew continued. As all of this was going on, scarlet fever began to claim Eureka. A ball that was scheduled by the Navy to thank locals had to be canceled, and the Navy camp and Cheyenne were quarantined. With trial pending, men had to depart for trial. 
Furthermore, as World War I tensions rose, Mare Island was already on high alert. <clears throat> Difficulties aside, the trial began on February 7th. Lieutenant Howe was questioned first, and he was the one who commanded the Cheyenne, and then Lieutenant Newton of the Milwaukee. Other officers were examined as witnesses. Over the course of the trial, Lieutenant Newton's story changed, perhaps as a testament to his inability to communicate. <laughs> the facts were established by February 13th, with many faults pointed out, and the opinion was given. The immediate cause was identified as Lieutenant Newton's actions. The secondary causes were the lack of a line to the Cheyenne, the fact that the Milwaukee's anchors were up, there was a dense fog, and the tow line from the Milwaukee to the H-3 could not be slipped. Furthermore, Lieutenant Howe was not justified in leaving decisions to Lieutenant Newton. The court also claimed that the salvage board must take some responsibility for their actions. Overall, there was a severe lack of coordination and planning. The court concluded that Lieutenant Howe would be tried by a general court-martial for his failures, and that Lieutenant Newton would be tried by a general court-martial for his failures, general neglect, and his violation of orders. No others were to be held responsible. By April 10, 1917, it was decided that the trials would be postponed due to entrance into World War I. The trials were not brought up again until January 3, 1919, almost two years later. The trial opportunity was due to expire on January 13, and haste was needed if they truly wanted to hold these men accountable. However, on January 10, the trials were revoked. These men would not face trial or punishment. And, <laughs> because the men were needed elsewhere due to the war, um, both had already been promoted to the rank of lieutenant commander. By 1920, they had again been promoted to commander. It is unclear at present how or if they served in the war. Whatever the case may be, they evidently earned higher rank regardless of these events that transpired on Samoa Beach. The events were inc inconsequential once war fervor engulfed the nation. The aftermath of the Milwaukee grounding was apparent for the officers and their crews. They were quickly swept, swept away from Eureka for trial and <coughs> subsequently for war efforts. As for the Humboldt locals, they were occupied in the salvage efforts for which they received contracts. The Mercer Fraser Company obviously succeeded in removing the H-3 submarine from the beach and it was launched into the bay on the 20th of April, 1917. The submarine's crew pranked locals, sank for a moment, <coughs> and then resurfaced before its farewell. The H-3 was overhauled in San Francisco and later saw combat during World War I. It is likely that the goods salvage from the Milwaukee also served in war efforts. The loss of the USS Milwaukee was an, un an unmerited and reckless attempt by the Navy to carry out a task without assistance. Given that the locals could successfully move the H-3 submarine and relaunch it in Humboldt Bay, the Milwaukee's present was presence was not even necessary in Eureka. The show of contempt towards locals cost the Navy a $7 million cruiser that might have proved useful once the U.S. engaged in war. Moreover, the men responsible were never brought to trial or punished for their actions. In fact, they went on to earn promotions. In the events that surrounded the groundings of the H-3 submarine and the USS Milwaukee, the Navy suffered and the locals cleverly profited from their suffering. <laughs> And here we have a little timeline of how quickly the ship sank in the sand. Um, that second photo is after only two years. Um, the news, I think it was the newspaper that called our sand notoriously live because it just involves things. <laughs> and this is what was left after a couple more years in the top corner there. After the pier was done being used, um, there were some remains that you can see people would play on. There's a little boy climbing up. <laughs> and then once the ship was left to the ocean, um, people would also play on that. As you can see, there's two boys playing. And this was what was left in 1929, before um, it was picked apart even further during World War II. Eventually, what remained of the USS Milwaukee was left to the locals. The ship was picked apart by scavengers and the sand, 
and slowly the ship sank until only her bulkheads peeked out of the sand and water at low tide. Approximately two-thirds of the ship remains buried today. The only reminders of the USS Milwaukee are those peaking bulkheads and a cement block sitting below a rock by Samoa, Samoa Boulevard upon which her name is inscribed. There is no testimony to her misfortune, just as there was no justice for her demise. <coughs> 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 I always think it's uh, good to give credit to the photographers that yes. uh, made the photo record, and I think the fact that it was a woman, Emma Freeman, mm -hmm. officially hired by the U.S. Navy that left us with uh, a wonderful photo record, so yeah. yay to Emma. And I have, I have that in my, uh, the, what I've written so far. For sake of time, I didn't include it in the slideshow today, but many of those pictures um, that you see up there were by Emma Freeman, who climbed all over the ship in her stockings. <laughs> there was just one death? Two, actually. Um, there was one <coughs> while they were building the trestle. Um, a gentleman who worked for Mr. Frazier fell off and drowned. Yes. What happened to the submarine? The submarine um, was relaunched and later saw war. Um, I don't have the records yet as to what sort of war it saw during World War One, but I do know it eventually saw mm -hmm. something. <laughs> Yeah. My information on the H-3 is that it really did not seek combat. It was used as a training vessel out of uh, uh, Mare Island. Okay. And then after the, the war, it was towed down to Louisiana and was in a mothball fleet, and then it was uh, ingloriously scrapped in the early 1930s. Hmm. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. oh, interesting. Yeah. How much do they figure is still buried out there? About two-thirds of it, wow. roughly. Wow. Um, it was picked apart a bit. Um, what you see here was mostly picked apart for um, scrap metal during World War II. But um, as you can tell, I mean, the sand's engulfed all the way up that far, so the majority of the bottom two-thirds of the ship are under the sand, except for the goods they needed to remove. Extreme low tide. Yeah. yeah. Negative tides, yeah. Yes, okay. You did an excellent job. <laughs> this is my boss. <laughs> <laughs> we booked this in to go try to see it where, where we want to go. You drive out off Simone Boulevard. Um, there's really just a tiny little dirt parking lot where you can fit about three cars. Um, there's a tall rock. You'll see this, that rock on the side of the road. It's across from the lumber mill. Yeah. And go at a negative tide. Right. So watch the paper and tide charts. Right. And if you get a negative seven or something, you can see bulkheads all the way along the beach. Oh, yeah. Cool. Cool. Mm -hmm. You can also see negative one. Tide going out. What? You can make it negative tide. two, I think. Yeah. The bulkheads are in Milwaukee. Straight out from the block. Yes. Yeah. What's the recently released documentation of what is the information that got given? That was the court martial, um, and a lot of the documents that gave me my timeline for the story were um, the letters that were sent between um, the men and the correspondents that had to narrate their whole version of the story for the trial. They had to document everything. So they were court martial records. Yeah, the court martial records, which included um, ship logs, um, correspondence between um, the men involved in the salvage, um, the salvage board, the Admiral Caperton. Um, there was even correspondence from Secretary of the Navy Josephus Daniels. Um, there was a lot included in that file from the National. But they Archives. were never court martialed because of the war. Right? Correct. Yes. Did any of them go on to prominence? That I haven't found out yet. One of the next things we're going to do in the research is get the uh, military records of both of those officers and find out exactly what they did in, in World War One and where they went on. What we got, the first batch we got was simply the, the, the 
court martial report. Well, they probably made Admiral. <laughs> 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 the, the USS Pueblo that came, um, is that the same um, USS Pueblo that we heard about later on? No. Oh, no. 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 Okay. So this okay. is the Milwaukee C-21. So. There were many other Milwaukee's. Okay. Yeah. Well, it, it would be interesting to know what the lieutenant's first words were when he went aground. <laughs> 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 seen something similar where <clears throat> it rolls downhill? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah. Were they promoting confidence? <laughs> yeah. At low, as you said, minus tide, you can see a lot of pickups at Centerville, too. Mm -hmm. mm. <laughs> <laughs> Could you go over again when the Milwaukee left Mare Island, yeah. or left uh, the dry dock, it was commanded by somebody else. Mm -hmm. And then somehow a junior lieutenant gets command of a heavy cruiser. So the reasoning behind that, um, because it wasn't dry dock and they didn't have a timeline for how long it would be there, um, since they were just gradually preparing for war, essentially. Um, Admiral Caperton, I believe, was the commander of the Milwaukee prior to being in dry dock. And he was reassigned to the USS San Diego, I believe. So he was down in Southern California while the Milwaukee was in um, San Francisco. And because Lieutenant Newton had commanded the tug Arapaho at the first round of salvage attempts, they assumed he was competent enough to command the Milwaukee. Mm. <laughs> mm. Thank you, folks. <laughs> two, two final comments, and I'll shut up. <laughs> uh, I want to emphasize that a, uh, a lieutenant in the Navy has a lot more uh, command power than a lieutenant in the Army, and they, they shouldn't be uh, compared at all with their authority. And then uh, the other point I wanted to make about the wreckage on Samoa Beach, uh, everything that you see on the beach is part of the superstructure, mm -hmm. and the, the main deck of the Milwaukee is flush to the beach. Mm -hmm. so. The, the southerly most piece of wreckage, uh, it took me a long time to figure out what it was. It looked like a kind of a, a, a cylindrical mass and some perhaps some gears, and I figured it out. It was the anchor winch on the bow, because its bow was facing south. Yeah. I'll take a check it out. One last question. One other question for me. You said that... Um, these files have just recently become declassified. Mm -hmm. What was so classified about the Milwaukee disaster, other than the fact that somebody, somebody really the... screwed the, the pooch? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, actually, it was all military yeah, files. Yeah, it was all okay. Right. So it's kind of a, a moving door as they declassify stuff. So it was everything. Every, it was and the personnel files, especially, that we haven't gotten to yet. But, but the, the, that opened them up and declassified the court martial. Okay, thank you. I, I wondered if anyone in the room had heard, I, I heard it was a kind of a rite of passage for a while to climb up the crow's nest that mm -hmm. was still sticking around for a long time. Does anyone else uh, yeah. oh. recall that? Yeah. I have a picture of my uncle up on the crow's nest. Yeah. I think you were there. That's not the kids just climbing along with that thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, one more thing. I brought uh, postcards, commemorative postcards. I don't have enough for everybody, but if anyone's interested and wants to look at some of them, they're, they're unique ones that many of you may have never seen before from, from uh, local photographers. I've also noticed several people brought items in. Bob Pembrose brought his little collection of stuff in, so when we break up, we can mug these guys. <laughs> thank you guys for bringing them stuff in. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming out. And remember thank to support you. the Historical Society. We need a new roof on the building, so uh, <laughs> keep us in mind. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.